how do you handle this passage where, you know, you are told to to avoid the scoffer? We only have so much time. We only have mm-hmm. so much energy. So to uh, put a lot of evangelistic energy into somebody who's hard-hearted, where you're you're just like you know bumping up against a brick wall, like that's that's not super fruitful. There's other places where you could spend that evangelistic energy. So. Welcome back to Footnotes with Dr. Tony Caffey. I'm your host, Adam Casalino, and with me, as always, is Dr. Tony Caffey. It's good to see you, Tony. Hey, Adam. Fascinating passage today, huh? Proverbs 9. I know. It it kind of feels like this crescendo of everything we've been learning so far, and it's like we've seen Lady Wisdom on her own, Lady Folly, and now they're like head-to-head. The artistry is fascinating to me uh, because of that, but also I think crescendo is a good word. Thanks for that because we've been building up to this for nine chapters. There is, I think, a break after chapter nine into a new section of Proverbs, so Mm -hmm. it does have this kind of capstone feel to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And, I mean, the artistry is just uh, just fascinating. Here's these two women calling out to young simpleton, giving a competitive, you know, I've got something for you. And as we know, because we've been studying for eight chapters, wisdom's got something better. That's right. So we looked at the whole chapter, uh, verses 1 through 18 of chapter 9. Uh, your first point was basically your main point, but then you kind of broke it down, which was heed wisdom and forsake folly. And as you said, this was the great showdown, the face-off between these two you know, women. Uh, and you said something interesting that was you know, very insightful, that wisdom outclasses folly in every way. Like, they both are kind of doing similar things, preparing... You know, wisdom preparing this amazing banquet. Folly has her own, you know, devices, and they're both calling to us. But with, like you said, wisdom is so far superior to folly, but yet so many people chase after folly. Yep. There's an instantaneous gratification that's part of wis- of Lady Folly's uh, pitch, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that goes back... I mean, Lady Folly, <clears throat> in many ways, is connected to the seductress of mm-hmm. Chapter 7. Yep. Um, and other chapters where we see this this draw to like satisfy the sexual appetites mm-hmm. of the man. It's more than just sex, but that's yeah. part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, sin sin is fun. Sin mm-hmm. is exciting. There's something appealing about following the world and doing what the world affirms. And mm-hmm. um, and I, I did make a point too to say that you know. God doesn't always reward righteous or wise behavior instantaneously. If he did, then everybody would do yep. the wise thing, the right thing, the sexually pure thing. Instead, he calls us to walk by faith, and mm-hmm. and Lady Wisdom isn't really in the business of instant gratification. It's mm-hmm. more of, you know, uh, long obedience in the same direction yep. and deriving the benefits of that over a period of time. I think we sense that. We're old enough, Adam, <laughs> now, where we... We see like ev- our wise behavior and our righteous behavior. Sometimes it took took a while to see the fruit of that mm-hmm. materialize, and that's the thing. Is you're teaching young people, you know, as you're kind of training up. Uh, in my case, the son. Like, mm-hmm. don't go after the instant gratification that, that so much of this world falls yeah. prey to. Build something that's lasting, that's valuable, that honors the Lord. Absolutely, because it feels like as you mature in Christ and you're hopefully growing in the wisdom he gives you, there is a satisfaction in wisdom itself, you know, and I can only describe that as something that God puts in your heart because our natural tendency is to get that quick fix, you know, just instantaneous, what is good for me, what's convenient. But as you grow in the Lord, and it for those who might be new to the faith, this might take time to realize there is a joy in doing the right thing. Yes. And, and even relishing wisdom, and we were going through this book of Proverbs, and I know many people have, are so excited to continue just to gain this wisdom, not just head stuff, but just this is God's character being displayed. And there are times when you you take the wise path to, to make the right decision as God is leading you, and you don't get that instant reward. Yeah. But even then, you're you're satisfied in knowing this is the right thing to do. We've been wrestling with this as we've read Desiring God mm-hmm. in our Preacher's Guide, oh, yeah. because... So much of that book is really, you know, go after those things that are most satisfying and most mm-hmm. joyful. And what we've been trying to make sense of is it's not always like 
mm-hmm. this great, joyful, wonderful thing to do right. Yeah. Sometimes it's a slog. Mm-hmm. I don't know if John Piper would agree with that, but yeah. it feels like that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like everybody, you know, this is how I felt in high school. Like everybody is having sex with random people. Mm-hmm. Everybody mm-hmm. is getting drunk at night and having a good time and coming to school and talking about it. Boy, that sure looks exciting and inviting. It must be better than what I'm doing. I'm, yeah. you know, trying to be faithful to the Lord. And and that was a wrestle in yeah. my heart. And it wasn't, I mean, that was 16, 17-year-old Tony. It wasn't until down the road where I was like, oh, no, this is the better way. Yep. And I'm glad I wasn't seduced into doing something that could wreck my life or mm-hmm. would, um, you know, start patterns of addiction that I couldn't get out of. So my mom was right, you know, to stay away from those things. And Absolutely. I was trained in a way that was helpful, but it wasn't always the 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 happy thing. Sometimes mm. I felt like the outsider yeah. uh, in my school or in my my spheres of influence. So Yep. And even times I've learned this a lot in marriage, there are times where the right thing when interacting or dealing with confrontation, like it's not fun at all. And I'd rather just avoid it and just let go yeah. with the flow. But that's that's the worst decision because it's not helpful to the relationship or to the issue. And so there have been times where the wise right thing would be to sit down with my wife and not necessarily like talk to her, but work out that issue. Yeah. And it's painful and it's difficult and we need a lot of grace to forgive and understand one another. But that's not fun. It's easier just to be like, ah, I won't deal with that. Yeah. But when you do and you talk about it and there's this attitude of love and trust and forgiveness then it's so much better over yep. time. And that's just one example like yours is, is, it's not fun. I didn't love having to talk about these issues or like you, like you as a teenager, I had to avoid all the stuff that everyone else was doing, but we see in time how much better that is. Marriage is the right, I think, uh, example of that. So, you know, in a sinful state, I could look at somebody like Tom Cruise and be like, boy, that guy's got a good, you know, a <laughs> yeah. different wife every three years <laughs> and some new exciting venture that he's on. And, I, you know, I've been married 23 years now, and I, the deep satisfaction that comes from being invested in the same person for 23 years, where we love each other, where we've gone through patterns of forgiveness, where yep. we've learned one another— Tom Cruise will never know that the 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 intimacy of that, the goodness of that, the sweetness of that, and I I think I told you already. I went to this small group in our church a, a few weeks ago, and like twenty three years, they all kind of scoffed at me, like, you know, <laughs> when you get to forty years, yeah. Pastor Tony, come talk to us, because yeah. most of the people in that group were married like forty, fifty, some, some even like almost sixty years, wow. and they were talking about the sweetness of that mm-hmm. and how they've grown up together and and been through different seasons of life together. And, oh, that's better. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't always sell to somebody who's young and impressionable and looking for instant gratification. Yeah. And that shows you how you can't get 60 years of marriage like that. And that's a perfect example, like you said, of wisdom paying off over time that that's a commitment, 60 years. But 60 years, like you can't you know, order that online. It's not a <laughs> Amazon instant delivery. Like that is worth the payoff, but you have to be that committed and invested as we talked about. So um, yeah. there's something really fascinating. You kind of jumping ahead because I think this is something that probably people want to talk about or think about. Um, in one of your points, you say, you know, according to wisdom, we need to be teachable, stay teachable, and invest in those who are teachable. And you said something, uh, don't waste time on those who are unteachable. And so I'm probably, uh, I'm sure that there's some people who want to kind of unpack that a little more yeah. because we have friends and relatives and neighbors who seem hard-headed, but we're like, man, if I just, just God kind of breaks through, maybe they'll learn, maybe they'll be open. So my question, my general question is, how can someone, because I think this is very important, you don't, like Jesus said, don't throw right. pearls before swine. How do we recognize that? When do we kind of step in and say, I'll always love them, but I got to move on? Boy, that's tough, yeah. isn't it? And we, in my small group on Sunday, we had some time to kind of talk this through, and mm-hmm. and I could see the people in my group agonizing over this. Yeah. Um I, I don't think, I guess I should offer a caveat. Like, I don't think you should not go to your Thanksgiving dinner because you have a brother-in-law who's a scoffer. Like, yeah. you still you still make that investment in family. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know how fruitful it would be if it is your brother-in-law or your your uncle or whatever 
to spend the bulk of your time there, though, trying to convince him that Christianity is the right way if he's, um, you know, a scoffer, if he's mocking, if he's just making the environment negative, if he's, you know, to use Jesus' words, trampling on something that's precious Mm -hmm. and, and valuable to you. So even in that, I think there's stewardship, but, you know, someone in my small group brought up the the example of a neighbor. Like, mm-hmm. it's good to be neighborly with somebody who's even a scoffer. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's not going to be like, I'm not even going to make eye contact with that person because he's a scoffer. <laughs> but but I, I do think we only have, and this is what Jesus was getting at, we only have so much time. We only have mm-hmm. so much energy. So to uh, put a lot of evangelistic energy into somebody who's hard-hearted, somebody who uh, isn't you know, and, and this might be part of my theological understanding that the Holy mm. Spirit isn't working to prepare them to receive right. the gospel, where you're just, you're just like, you know, bumping up against a brick wall. Like, that's that's not super fruitful. And there's other avenues, there's other places where you could spend that evangelistic energy. So mm-hmm. I, I guess in that way, I was trying to be uh, practical, but also biblical, because, mm-hmm. you know, how do you handle this passage where, you know, you are told to to avoid the scoffer. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll give you a good passage to help kind of make this balance. There's later in the book of Proverbs, we'll get to it eventually, about correcting the, uh, is it the scoffer? A similar word is used where um, you're, at first you're told to correct them, and then later don't correct them, you know? <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, which one is it, Solomon? <laughs> and the answer is it depends. It depends on the circumstance. It depends on you know, um, in one one instance, it's like you'll be labeled a fool yourself if you do that. But in the next instance, it's to correct him. I think in a way where if it's a public setting, other people will know the nature of the folly that that person is demonstrating. So mm-hmm. there's there's more people yeah. maybe listening, or um, he won't be affirmed in his foolishness. So it depends. It depends on your circumstances. I would encourage Christians to be prayerful. Mm-hmm to ask the Lord, to uh, give wisdom. I don't, I don't know about you, Adam. I mean, you're not as old as I am, but you reach a, per, uh, a stage in life and you're like, man, I don't know how many years I have left. Mm. I don't even know how many days I have left. Yeah. I'm being a little dramatic here, but <laughs> I don't want to waste a lot of the tail end of my life chasing things that are unprofitable and unfruitful and trying to convince scoffers of how awesome Jesus is when they... Yeah. They just, you know, denigrate him. You know, I'm thinking of social media now. How many fruitful, fruit, fruitless ventures does that end up yeah. turning into? So yeah. I want to use my energy and steward it effectively for those things that are most fruitful, those places where the Holy Spirit is moving and working and where mm-hmm. there's, um, you know, a responsiveness. Yeah. So. Absolutely. I remember experiencing something like that when I was in high school. When I first came to Christ and I was kind of very open and sharing with my classmates, and there were those people who were just so stubborn, so belligerent. And they're, you know, when I would spend time talking to them, and, and opportunities would arise just because they would say something crass or foolish or stupid, and I would mm-hmm. respond in a biblical way, and that would sometimes lead to a conversation. And they were just some people who were just hard headed, stubborn, resistant, said nasty things. Um, and that was most people. But then there were some people I didn't even have to try, and they would come up to me and be like, oh, like, why are you reading the Bible? What's that on your shirt? Are you you go to a youth group, and I didn't, and I would invite them to my youth group, and they would be eager to talk about the Lord. And many of them, I know one particular person came to Christ, brought her family, the whole family came to Christ, and became members of the church. And it wasn't like I wasn't even trying. They just God opened up those doors, and other yep. people who were eager to learn and to pray and to ask for help. And it was like it took me time to recognize. I shouldn't keep banging my head to reach these people who clearly, you know, they know what, who, what I'm about. I've told them they, if they're interested, if, if later, if they're open, that's fine. But why don't I spend more time with this group of people who are like, in, incidentally, not the popular kids, not the mm-hmm. star quarterback or the prom queen, just regular kids who just wanted Jesus and, and eventually that clicked. Like I should go where the harvest is ripe. And, uh, I think we kind of figure that out. Sometimes they make the decision for us. They're like, no thanks, shut the door. Yep. But our, our, I think our natural inclination is to want, no, they need Jesus. I want to help. I want to share. But if, if it's a hard heart, keep praying for them. 
you know, they might come to you later, but when you see fertile ground, when you see the fruit, don't neglect it and, and embrace the, the, the opportunities God gives you. I, I think, I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but I, there's so much going on in our culture right now that I could comment on as a pastor. So it seems like the Grammy Awards or the the Oscars, it's it's like a race to the bottom to see who could be the most <laughs> offensive to Christians. Yeah. You got people dancing on stage, transgender, wearing Satan costumes. Like, yeah. if I wanted to on Sunday morning, I could just get up there and just announce everything. But, yeah. you know, all you're doing is giving free publicity to ridiculousness. Like, I don't, <laughs> it's not even worth talking about because yeah. it's, it's obvious that there's a desire with these attempts to just draw attention to yourself. And who can be the most mm -hmm. transgressive in terms of, the, the Christian heritage that we have as a country and just like, well, don't even bother, like just minister to the, the people in your church and help them to see and to understand and, and invest your time and your energy in those things that are profitable instead of, you know, giving free publicity to scoffers out there. Cool. So as we were moving through the text, you brought up an interesting one that might be fun to, to explore for us eggheads in the group. Um, you mentioned when the passage, I think it's verse 10, mentions the Holy One. It's actually plural. Yeah. And you called it the plural. Kedashim. The plural of majesty or plurality of majesty. Um, is there any more that we could kind of like discuss? the royal we would be the yeah. closest thing to that in English. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, in, in English, we don't really differentiate as much uh, sometimes between plurals and singulars. We do with mm -hmm. we and I, but, you know, the you... You, I guess we have y'all, which is great, but <laughs> you, you. Um, in other cultures, other societies, sometimes you would activate the plural in order to give somebody a little more gravity. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my wife's language, Croatian, whenever a younger person addresses an older person, instead of saying uh, you, you would use the plural of you in that context. So it's just a way to show respect to somebody who's older. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was learning Croatian, um, I would say kakosi, which is like, how are you? To, and if I ever, and I was young when I got married, you know, so if I did that to an older person, my, my wife would rebuke <laughs> me, you know, not kakosi, it's kakoste. How are you? How are y'all, you know, to put it in our colloquialism? And it just sounds odd to us. Like, mm -hmm. what? that's not two people. It's one person. Yeah. But it's a way of giving respect, and we see uh, we see examples of that in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The most famous example is Elohim, mm -hmm. this word for God, which is you know used even plural to describe gods. Uh, those aren't different words in Hebrew, mm -hmm. um, but in Genesis one, we're not talking about gods; we're talking about the elevated. Mm -hmm. Holy One, the God of the universe, the deity who's creating everything. So something similar is at work there. And actually, this verse is really helpful because if we saw Kedashim just kind of on its own without the parallelism of that verse, mm -hmm. we might say, oh, this, these are the angels, oh. or these are the, I don't know, the the, the patriarchs of the faith, maybe. Mm -hmm. But the parallelism there is you know, the Lord, the fear of the Lord, and then you have knowledge of the Holy One. Mm. So he's saying this is to that, as you connect the parallelism, it's like, oh, the Holy Ones is Yahweh. What's meant by that? The the implication there is that we're using a plural of majesty mm. to describe the ultimate Holy One, yeah. who is Yahweh. Awesome. So uh, as we get to the end of the passage, we see once again Lady Folly is right there in the same, almost in the same location as Lady Wisdom. She has this spot yep. at the highest places, and it got me thinking about that because it's it's so interesting that Solomon is, pre is presenting the choices that we have: wisdom or folly. But he's he's obviously describing them as women who are making this appeal. Mm -hmm. And at first, you think, well, if wisdom's so great, why is folly allowed? the same place. And it made me think of like a legal battle where you have prosecution and defense. <laughs> one is right, one is wrong, but both get to make their pitch to the jury or judge. Yep. And it's like, <clears throat> you would think it'd just be easy. God, just get rid of Lady Folly. Just get rid of Folly. Get rid of foolishness. Why even give her the same location near the Lady Wisdom? And it's, mm. it's an interesting... Um, almost contrast, but, it, but I think it, it depicts... Um, the choices we have in a, this life, you know, we have 
the path of life, as you described, the Derek of life and the Derek of death. And while it might be nice for God to be like, all right, Lady Folly, you're we're kicking you out. It, they're still being presented to us. Right. Which is similar to what I talked about earlier with the, uh, you know, if, if there was instantaneous positive results for every wise thing, then everybody yep. would be wise. There, there would even be kind of a, a, a self-promotion in that. Mm. Well, of course, I'm not going to have sex with somebody because who's not my spouse, because if I do, I'll get hit by an asteroid or I'll <laughs> yeah. die immediately. Um so there is a walk by faith component to this. I, I think that's uh, demonstrated here where, you know, we as human beings, we we have a, a draw, a desire for foolishness. There's mm-hmm. something appealing about it. And I mean, you could ask the same questions of the Israelites, like, why are they chasing Baal? <laughs> like, this is the God of the people that you just came into yeah. their country and destroyed. You know, this 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 is the god of your enemies. Why why Marduk? Why mm. um, let's see, Anut, Asherah, mm. uh, Chemosh. I'm trying to think of all the gods. Molech. Molech. You know, yeah. like these these are the wicked peoples. In some cases, that had child sacrifice. That yeah. you know, your whole entire cultural paradigm is built on being different from that and being the 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 people of Yahweh. And yet still inside of us, there's this desire for idolatry, for other gods, for counterfeits. It's just just there, Adam. I wish it wasn't, but it is. And um, God, uh, even in the New Testament world, there's... Think about it. There's the goodness of following Christ, being saved, having eternity, um, you know, secured for Mm -hmm. us. In addition to that, the better life that's that we're talking about here in yeah. terms of married to one person, loving mm-hmm. one person, faithfulness, purity, uh, relationships in the church. Like, I can make a case for that, like, as being the best thing in the world. Why would anybody choose against that? And I, mm-hmm. I can even say in my own life, to try to give an example of all the great things that have happened, yeah. even God helping me through all the struggles in life, but mm-hmm. still so many people choose the way of folly, the the way that leads to death. So. Mm-hmm. Broad is the road that leads to destruction, Jesus said, right? That's right. That's right. And narrow is the path that leads to life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we wrap up, um, looking ahead, maybe as a teaser for next week, yeah. uh, the next few chapters, they're structured very differently. Uh, can you give us a glimpse of how you're going to approach it since they're like kind of just individual proverbs? Yeah. How are you going to make that into a single message? Uh Short answer is I don't know, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> well, you so, got a week, yeah. To full it disclosure: out. I've preached through Proverbs one through nine before, which mm. is a nice little unit and yeah. gives people, I think, a flavor of the Book of Proverbs. Um, and I've preached Proverbs ten through thirty-one before, arranged more topically. Mm. So, what does the Proverbs say about uh, marriage, about money, about the tongue, about et cetera? I think I did about ten or ten to twelve messages. Uh, topically like that, just deriving. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we're verse-by-verse verse fellowship, so we're going to go verse-by-verse verse through, um, you know, chapters 10 through 31. So I guess I guess we'll see. How's that for a mm. teaser? Yeah. We'll, we'll see. It could, you know, I was joking with Kyle once, it might be a 31-point message each Sunday. <laughs> each <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be doing a lot of writing. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not because, um, you know, Bruce Waltke and others have seen uh, some some structure to it mm-hmm. in, in places where others have looked at this and said it's just totally random, mm-hmm. all those chapters. So yeah. I see a little bit of structure that I'm going to try to organize around, cool. but it's going to have definitely less structure than what we've seen in Proverbs 1 through 9 and less structure than some of the other books of the Old and New Testament. Cool. So we'll see. Awesome. So if that has piqued your interest, stay tuned. Check us out next Sunday. Um, Thank you for uh, tuning in. Thank you, Pastor Tony, as always. Um, Every episode, of course, is available on this channel as well as the original message. See you next time.